Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Cannon, and on behalf of the Institute for Humane Studies, I'd like to welcome you to this summer seminar on the classical liberal tradition. I manage the programs at IHS that help grad students succeed in their PhD work and beyond, and that's why we're hosting this event, because IHS exists to support scholars working in and with classical liberal ideas. This is something of a historical event for us because it's the first time since the seminar started nearly 50 years ago that ITES has held any part of them online. And that's allowed us to open these lectures to everyone for the first time, and it's why we're so happy that you've joined us. We've chosen the topic for this seminar, the classical liberal tradition, because we see it as very much a living tradition, adapting and evolving, and it's a tradition that faces great challenges in, in 2020. It's classical in the sense that it draws from some of the earliest liberal thinkers like Adam Smith and J.S. Mill, but it extends through the 20th and 21st century writers like F.A. Hayek and Eleanor Ostrom, both Nobel laureates, and Hayek himself actually spoke at these seminars. What unites the folks you'll meet this week isn't any single dogma or doctrine, but instead a commitment to freedom. Freedom in markets, freedom in politics, and in our private lives. And as you'll see over the course of the week, there's a lot of diversity in how that commitment manifests itself. So we've got right liberals and left liberals. You will meet conservatives and anarchists and social democrats and everything in between. And we welcome that sort of diversity. Uh, we think it's less about the right answers than about asking the right questions. And that's why we're here this week. IHS runs several programs for PhD students that uh, you should know about if you're a grad student. Uh, we have funding opportunities, seminars like these, networking opportunities, all sorts of great programs. Uh, I will be talking about those in my closing remarks. So with all of that out of the way, it is my distinct privilege to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Stephen Davies, a longtime friend of IHS formerly a senior lecturer at the Department of History and Economic History at Manchester Metropolitan University. Steve is now the head of education at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. He is the author of many books. He loves heavy metal music and is a keen observer of the fortunes of Manchester City. The title of his lecture, uh, this lecture, the first of his three, is Liberalism and the Transformation of the World. Professor Davies, over to you. Thanks very much, Jason. And I'm delighted to be here again at an IHS seminar. Uh, only sad that I have to join you all remotely from uh, wet and rainy Manchester here in the UK, rather than being over in uh, hot and sunny uh, America right now. But uh, the ones of technology being what they are, uh, this is the best we can do given the current circumstances, and maybe it's got its own advantages. So what I'm going to talk about in this lecture uh, is really what it says on this uh, front page slide, which is the part that liberalism played uh, in the shaping the content and form of the modern world, the world in which we live, the degree to which the kind of world that we live in now is one that was actually produced by liberalism. But also, uh, I'm going to uh, sort of argue for a particular way of thinking about or understanding liberalism, which is what you might call, given that I'm a historian, a historical approach as opposed to a philosophical or economic one. And so the process I'm going to look at, or the vignettes I'm going to go through, are part of a process which not only determined the nature of the modern world, but also shaped liberalism itself. So there's a kind of curious two-way process going on here, as we'll see, I hope. So first of all, how to think about uh, the topic of this talk, how to think about liberalism and modern liberty. Now, in one sense, liberty has existed for a very long time, both as idea and practice, as it says here. Uh, there's always been, if you like, personal liberty, personal freedom, relations between individuals based upon the principle of liberty, the principle that is of free association uh, between individuals, free agreements voluntarily entered into, uh, binding only to the extent that people explicitly consent to it, as opposed to other kinds of human relations. And so what we see throughout history uh, is a dialectic, if you will, a to and fro between what you might call the two opposed principles of freedom and domination. Uh, some of you may recognize that as an allusion to uh, a major work of liberal scholarship 
by the title of Freedom and Domination by Alexander Rusto, uh, an interpretation of uh, history and of modern society that was published back in the 1950s. But the point is that throughout history, there's an interplay between these two principles. But it's also a saying that throughout most of history, it's the principle of domination that is dominant. There are, in every civilization, in every uh, part of the world, people who advocate the liberty principle, the principle that human life should be organized to the greatest extent possible around the principle of free relations, individual autonomy, personal choice, personal self-direction, uh, and restrictions and restraints upon the use of power, force, and coercion. But it's very much a minority perspective. And as the Italian-American uh, historian Massimo Salvadori put it, it's a heresy. And that's why uh, the title of his big conspectus of uh, the history of global liberalism is called The Liberal Heresy. And many of these people suffered the traditional fate of heretics, not a pleasant or nice one. But since about 1770, uh, liberal ideas have become more systematic, more organized, if you like. You gradually see from 1770 onwards, maybe a bit before then, but certainly since 1770, the development of a much more worked out and elaborated set of beliefs and ideas uh, with relevance and application to a whole number of areas of intellectual study and also a whole number of areas of life. Now, these ideas are still controversial. There are still many, many people out there who fundamentally disagree with them or reject them. There's a kind of periodic fashion every uh, few decades for books about why liberalism has failed. That's sort of a currently very popular idea, title, of course, of a book recently published by Pat Deneen. Uh, somehow these keep on going on, but liberalism su survives as well. So it's still very, very controversial, but it's also influential. It has an impact upon the world and it's done a large part to shape the way the world has grown since 1770. Now, since the 1820s, roughly, you have an actual self-aware political movement uh, of activists, uh, of intellectuals, of people engaged in the game, if you like, of trying to persuade others and engaging in politics, who deliberately self-identify with the word liberal as a label to describe the position that they hold and that they're coming from. It's anachronistic, I think, to use the term in that sense before the 1820s. Uh, you have people who are like proto-liberals before then, but liberals with a capital L uh, are really only begin to appear in the 1820s. Uh, now, this poses a big, big question, which I'll say more about in a moment. Is liberalism the cause of the modern world or is it a consequence of modernity? Does liberalism create the modern world and bring it into existence, or is it that the way the modern world comes about produces liberalism as a kind of side effect or product? Uh, and the answer, of course, to anyone who's done history will not be surprised to know, is it's both. Uh, typically, by the way, in history, whenever you get uh, presented with a kind of a supposedly binary choice like that, the usual answer actually is that both ways of looking at it are correct, and the binary is actually false. That's the normal kind of conclusion that most historians come up to. Uh, so here is one of the points I want to make first of all. A lot of the books that you will read about liberalism, classical liberalism, or other variants of liberalism, uh, that have been written in the last 40 to 50 years, certainly, uh, are, tend to be written by economists, uh, philosophers, political theorists, and they typically take an ideas or theory based approach in which the starting point is to think, well, OK, how do we define liberalism as an idea or a theory? And what this leads to is foundationalism. It leads to a search for some kind of ultimately foundational starting point, principle uh, or observation or insight that the rest of the body of liberal thought can be deduced from as a kind of necessary set of corollaries or theory that follow from these initial axioms. You can see this, for example, in Ludwig von Mises. You can see it in many uh, contemporary liberal theorists. Uh, it's perhaps the dominant way of thinking. Now, nothing, I'm not saying this is wrong. It's actually quite a useful intellectual exercise in many ways. But from my point of view as a historian, there's problems with it. One of the problems is this. It leads to a model, a way of understanding actual historical liberalism, in which the people who are the really important drivers uh, are ultimately the thinkers and philosophers. 
And the idea is that thinkers and philosophers, maybe in the academy, maybe elsewhere, come up with ideas, and the ideas are then put into effect by uh, the foot soldiers, if you will, uh, the people, the politicians, political activists, the campaigners, uh, maybe the religious leaders or business people who buy into those ideas. So the spring, the fonds at Origo, if you will, uh, is the original thinker. And this is a very popular way of thinking about it. Uh, now, actually, I think that from a historian's point of view, uh, it, makes, it makes sense to think of it in a different way. According to this, liberalism is a kind of civilization. It's a way of living, a political order, and a culture, all of which together form what you could call a civilization. And this civilization appears, this way of living, if you like, appears for the first time in a particular time and place. It then pops up uh, subsequently in other times and places, typically with a distinct and different local flavor. You should be aware of the narrative of diffusionism, which is the idea that it appears in one place and then kind of spreads outward from that place. I don't think that works either as a sociological theory uh, or as a historical one. Now, what this means is that you're dealing with a process of historical emergence. And in that process of historical emergence, it's not just or even primarily uh, the thinkers and the intellectuals. In many cases, what you find is that the ideas actually come second. What you get in the first place are things like campaigns, uh, campaigns around a particular issue, for example, with the worked out ideas and ideology produced uh, in order to justify the campaign or after the campaign has actually uh, taken place and in many cases succeeded. And so in this case, ideas are as much a consequence or a secondary phenomenon as they are a primary one. What you start off with perhaps is sentiments or uh, sensibilities, orientations, a very broad kind of moral orientation typically towards the world, which leads people to take a particular kind of view of the world in which they find themselves, uh, which leads them to undertake certain actions and then they in turn then try to work out in a more elaborate or theoretical form why it is exactly that they're doing what they're doing. Those ideas once produced, of course, then loop back into action in a kind of uh, positive feedback loop. Uh, so the ideas are enormously important. Uh, but I think that what you have to realize is that when you think of liberalism and liberal civilization as historical phenomena, uh, that you're dealing with something more complex than the straightforward idea that somebody comes up with a theory and then gets instantiated. And liberalism historically is defined, and liberal civilization is defined, and this is what I'm going to go on to talk about more, as a process of like conversation or debate with two other kind of clusters or movements of ideas. Now, this way of thinking is one that I actually picked up at one of these uh, seminars uh, quite a few years ago now, when I heard a lecture by uh, somebody you're going to hear from later on today, uh, Jacob Levy. And it was Jacob who introduced me to this way of thinking uh, and it had a kind of crystallizing or clarifying effect on my mind as soon as I heard him say it. Uh, and so if you want to think of it diagrammatically, this is a way to think of the kind of conversation or politics of modernity. There are three broad clusters or conversations going on, uh, overlapping and intertangled. You can describe them, I suppose, as liberalism and liberty, uh, conservatism and scepticism or limits, uh, and radicalism and egalitarianism. Those are the three sort of poles. Uh, some of the people in the two other circles, if you will, are compatible with liberalism. They have ideas which are uh, critical of liberalism, but not fundamentally or radically incompatible. But other people, on the other hand, are clearly not compatible. And much of what I'm going to talk about is the way in which a lot of liberalism was defined and the content of modernity was defined in turn through the interactions between keeping people coming from the liberal conversation uh, with people coming from the strongly anti-liberal forms uh, of the other. So here is the whole question about liberalism and modernity. Uh, in one sense, liberalism is a response to and it's produced by the material and social conditions of modernity. It's only when you get the kind of phenomena of modernity, such as high levels of urbanization, uh, lots of sustained intensive growth and technological innovation, that you can actually have a kind of conceivable or practical liberal politics as opposed to a heresy. Uh, 
But at the same time, it's also a cause of these conditions. This is the argument made by Deirdre McCloskey, for example. She argues that it's essentially the profound liberal insight that you should simply leave people alone, leave them to do their thing, that is responsible for all the changes that we see in modernity. Now, I don't fully accept, accept that uh, because I, I think I agree completely with most of what, 90% of what uh, she says, but I think that it's not the only cause. There are other reasons as well why modernity appears uh, in the way that it does. But, and this is the main point that I want to go into look at, a uh, point I've already made, liberalism as it emerges has a huge influence on the form and direction that modernity takes. So here are the three main theses I want to put to you. Uh, the first is that it was not inevitable that the modern world would be as liberal as it is or has become. In other words, we could very easily have had a world that was modern, but non-liberal. We could have had uh, a world, and indeed in some parts of the world, we do have a world which is modern in the sense that it has many features of modernity, a modern economy to a great degree, a lot of modern technology, uh, modern ways of living, such as high degrees of urbanization and the like, but which also, in terms of their political, intellectual, social, moral lives, are clearly and explicitly non-liberal or even anti-liberal. Uh, it was not inevitable or natural or determined that as the world became modern, it would also become liberal. Uh, that, I think, is a fantasy, and I'll have more to say about that later on. The point was that, and is, that there's alternative modernities. As well as the liberal vision of what modernity should be like, uh, there are also rival visions, uh, visions of a world that is modern in some sense, but not liberal. And these are often partially or actually realized. And the reason why ultimately uh, many of them are not realized uh, or only realised to a very partial degree, while a more liberal kind of vision of modernity is the one that actually does emerge along with the liberal ideas and movement, is down to two things. It says here, intellectual debates and arguments, but also very often uh, political conflict, including violent political conflict. Uh, this is not simply a matter of debate seminars. I mean, there have been serious political conflicts uh, involving uh, great degree, a great degree of personal sacrifice and often uh, political violence. You obviously want to avoid that. And one of the central features of the liberal approach, in fact, has been anti-revolutionism. Uh, opposition to and hostility to the idea that violent and radical revolution is the way to change the world. But that doesn't mean that there haven't been uh, occasions where people have had to be like stand up and fight. So here is the first of those alternatives. Uh, this is one which was a major and real life alternative uh, for a large part of the 19th century, particularly in the United States. Uh, this is a form of modernity and a modern economy and society where slavery has a central place. So the first point I would make is I would argue very strongly uh, that slavery is quite clearly empirically compatible with a form of modern economy, with a capitalist economy, if you will. If you look at the society of the antebellum South, uh, or a number of other societies of the same period, such as Brazil, what you can clearly see is a capitalist market modern economy in many ways. But it's also one in which, as we all know, slavery has a central part to play. And so if you look at the actual agenda of uh, the Confederacy, both before the Confederacy actually was set up in the two decades, particularly the one decade immediately before secession in 1861, and then during the Civil War period, what you can see is that there's a very clear and explicit agenda on the part of intellectuals and apologists like George Fitzhugh to try and create a kind of modernity based upon slavery and power and domination relations uh, that follow from that. Uh, that's why one of his books is actually called The Failure of the Free Society. Uh, Fitzhugh is one of the great anti-liberal theorists. But it's not just uh, the Confederacy. That's simply the best known and most explicit example of it. 
Uh, there's also other cases. There are people in Brazil who are arguing for a similar agenda. There are also people in the British West Indies, particularly Barbados, uh, who are arguing for this. Uh, and also, the, you could argue that this is a feature of later regimes, particularly Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union under Stalin. Uh, in both of those cases, you get again the creation of a kind of economy and a kind of society where systematic and large scale slave labor, uh, forced labor, is one of the key institutions, not only for economic reasons, but also for other social reasons. That's particularly true, of course, in the Nazi case. Uh, not quite as central in the case of Stalin's uh, Soviet Union, although it is an important feature there, but in the Nazi case, a central one. So in some ways, that was a revival of the earlier agenda. Now, this point, uh, uh, this kind of alternative, was confronted both intellectually and in the American case, physically, by liberals. And so there was an enormous debate about slavery uh, and its place in society throughout the 19th century, which resulted by the end of the 19th century, by 1878, when slavery was abolished in Brazil, uh, in a comprehensive victory for the liberal side. Uh, even the most crazy anti-liberals today are not prepared to say, or not bold enough to come out and say that they actually favor slavery. Uh, even Slavoj Zizek is not that daft. Uh, it's worth saying, finally, that this kind of idea is also found in later forms of imperialism, notably in the Congo under Leopold II, uh, but also even more dramatically uh, in German imperialism in both Southwest Africa, Namibia as it now is, uh, and German East Africa, now Tanzania. If you look at the way those colonies were run under Imperial Germany, the actual kind of society that they were looking to build up in those colonial positions was this kind of thing, a slave-based form of modernity. Uh, this is an illustration of the point. Uh, this is the frontispiece of Debo's uh, journal, which is the great sort of like intellectual uh, center of the antebellum South uh, and the major campaigner for a program to turn the modern South, the South into a modern but slave based society. So you'll see here this woman who looks remarkably like Britannia, who represents the South, of course. Uh, and you should, you'll notice she's surrounded by bales of cotton and also barrels of, I presume, rum. Uh, but in the background, you'll also notice smoke coming out of the factory chimneys, lots of sailing ships, steamships, uh, a big railway viaduct. In other words, all of the trappings of modernity. Uh, and if you read any of the issues of Du Bois magazine, that's exactly the agenda that is being pushed there. Here's another one that is the attempt to revive or to modernize the traditional Baroque absolute state. This is the agenda, you, if you like, of the enlightened despots. Uh, the people who were running a large part of Europe just before uh, the outbreak of the French Revolution. They are actually looking to create a modern state, but one in which they remain in charge and in which the traditional institutions uh, and systems of the pre-modern Ancien Regime uh, survive. And a key feature of this is religious authoritarianism. Uh, adopt, these are all uh, visions of modernity in which the political order is a confessional one and in which the liberal values of individual freedom of conscience and pluralism are explicitly disavowed. Now the major actual example of this uh, is late Tsarist Russia under the last two hours, Alexander III and Nicholas II, particularly in the last, very last phase of Nicholas's reign uh, when the key figures in his government are Peter Stolypin uh, and Sergei Vita, uh, the industry minister. Uh, the ideology which most expresses this is something called cameralism, which is a set of theories and arguments about how to run a modern monarchical state developed in 17th and 18th century Germany. Uh, and this has, this is a rather controversial claim, I would argue that there are certain other philosophies uh, such as distributism and agrarianism, which are related to this alternative, which are much more benign. They don't have the overtly and strongly anti-liberal elements of the uh, kind of thing I'm talking about. This is an example here. This is the Putilov works uh, in Petrograd uh, just before the outbreak of World War I. This was an enormous uh, factory and production plant in uh, Petrograd, one of the largest in Europe at the time, 
Uh, and uh, it was also, however, part of this whole process of modernization that Vita and the rest of the Tsar's ministers were undertaking while still at the time uh, creating or uh, sustaining, as they hoped, something like a traditional form of Tsarist autocracy. Uh, you'll notice how everyone here is posed rather dramatically. This is the third alternative. This is the one of authoritarian nationalism, of which Imperial Germany is the main example. Later on, Imperial Japan, particularly after the Taisho Emperor dies and is replaced by the Showa Emperor, Hirohito. Uh, those are the two big examples, but it's also found in all the other places that I list here. Now, this is not just a matter of uh, nationalism, uh, as a doctrine of national independence and greatness. It's also associated with a complete vision of society, of social life, political life, uh, and the like, which is again explicitly uh, and overtly anti-liberal. There are major political conflicts in several countries, and in both Germany and Japan, liberals are initially uh, defeated. They put up a great fight, especially in Germany, but they are ultimately defeated. Uh, However, uh, of course, there are a number of conflicts, particularly in Latin America, but also, of course, there's a world war, which ultimately sees the defeat of this kind of political agenda, or two world wars, uh, if you count Japan. Uh, here is a, a kind of rogues gallery. Uh, this is Werner Sombart, um, one of the major exponents of this kind of philosophy. As Ludwig von Mises wrote, the one constant in Sombart's intellectual life was his profound hatred of bourgeois liberalism and liberty. Uh, definitely one of the bad guys, enormously influential though. He's perhaps the most influential economic historian uh, of the late 19th and early 20th century, even though he's under a cloud these days. Here is another one, Heinrich von Treitschke, uh, German historian uh, in, the, again, the late 19th, early 20th century. And if you want really hard doubts, hardcore, straight down the line, and explicit anti-liberal uh, politics and thinking, Treitschke is your man. Now, obviously, another alternative was fascism. What was fascism? Well, it was, as it says here, very much an attempt to create a new industrial civilization. It was a response to modernity, which sought to create a kind of hyper-modernism in a way, but one which uh, had obviously explicitly and profoundly anti-liberal elements. And much of 20th century liberalism is defined in opposition to this uh, and also communism, of which more in a moment. Uh, as it says, it has a strong aesthetic element. So there's a kind of cultural art and design aspect to fascism, which is not incidental, it's central, because it's part of the whole project. It's all about trying to create a kind of culture uh, and a kind of consciousness associated with that culture, which will emphasize a whole series of deeply anti-liberal values. Uh, the primacy of sacrifice, for example, subordination of the individual goal uh, to or individual life to larger collective entities and enterprises. Uh, it's connected to the previous project, but it's much more radical uh, and it rejects much of the kind of uh, agenda of the sort of traditional authoritarian conservative that Trajka was. Uh, it's a far more far reaching and on its own grounds and lights revolutionary project, one which is designed to sweep away what is left of the old world and to create something radically new, the new world order, of course, uh, that Hitler and his uh, allies and friends were talking about in the 1930s and during World War II. Here's some examples of what I mean by that. This is a model for what Hitler was planning to do to Berlin. Uh, it was to be completely rebuilt and named Germania. Uh, and you'll notice here several things about the aesthetics, but also something about this landscape that tells you something about the political project. There's the emphasis upon power, the em all the straight lines, the emphasis upon discipline, upon pattern, structured, ordered life. No spontaneity, no room for uh, the quirky or the odd. Everything ruthlessly organised. Uh, notice also the enormous building at the end there, the Volkshalle, uh, which is meant to quite explicitly emulate the pantheon of Rome. Uh, again, quite an explicit and interesting allusion because it emphasizes the idea that what you're dealing with here uh, is an imperial regime, uh, one that is all about the structured and systematic exercise of power. Uh, and of course, there was an enormous debate in the course of the 20th century in which 
many ideas that have previously been tolerated or accepted within liberalism came to be rejected because it became obvious to uh, the liberal interlocutors of fascism and uh, related movements that those ideas are in fact uh, not compatible with what they themselves believed, their individualism and emphasis upon individual liberty. Uh, this is another piece of fascist art. This is futurist art from fascist Italy. Uh, still amazingly influential on art today, by the way. Uh, notice here all the classic signs of uh, futurism and of fascist art. The emphasis upon force, speed, power, dynamism, uh, which are central parts of the aesthetic. Soviet communism is another example of this. Again, it's another attempt to create a new kind of modern civilization. And if you look at the uh, USSR in the 1920s, and particularly under Stalin, as it says here, there's a very clear project of creating a new kind of civilization, which is not, not just economic, in fact, maybe arguably not even primarily economic. There's also uh, the whole cultural and artistic agenda, a transformation also of the ways of living, which emphasize collectivism, uh, collective experience, as opposed to the domestic, the personal, the private. Uh, there was the attempt to create a new kind of consciousness, a new Soviet man if you will. Uh, and although this project in some sense lingers on, I would argue, and this is quite a controversial view I'm putting in my third point on this slide, that he was actually abandoned under Khrushchev, uh, that following Stalin's death, they settled for a much more modest goal, which was to try to outcompete the capitalist West in terms of creating the kind of modern consumer society that had already begun to emerge in the mid 20th century in the United States and elsewhere, uh, an endeavor in which they failed, of course. And what they did was to give up on their alternative vision of the modern world. Uh, this is a Soviet poster which illustrates the kind of thing I'm talking about. This is actually the idea uh, for a huge dam right across the Bering Straits between Alaska uh, and Russia. Uh, and again, you'll notice the kind of quite distinct aesthetic associated with this. But also notice that this is a structure uh, and a picture in which you see no individual human beings. Uh, it's all about, as you could imagine, obviously, planning, control, centralization, top-down authority. And in the contemporary world, we still have projects of this kind. If you're a liberal living today, you still have interlocutors, opponents, uh, who are trying to create non-liberal forms of modernity. Uh, for example, there is what you could call Islamism. And people in this context typically think of ISIS or other very extreme movements like Hezbollah terror or uh, Al-Qaeda, but actually there's a more moderate sort of conservative project which you find in places like the Gulf states uh, or in Saudi Arabia, which is to create a highly modernistic society. Dubai is in some sense a kind of uh, picture book of a hyper modernity, uh, but again it's a society which is clearly and explicitly uh, not liberal uh, in all sorts of ways because the agenda other than the technological, is explicitly anti-liberal. And so again, there's a process of uh, argument, debate, campaigning, uh, and even conflict going on between liberals and non-liberals uh, in that part of the world, and indeed in other parts of the world, such as Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, uh, and large parts of Africa. Uh, another one, obviously, and this is the big one in many ways, is contemporary China. Uh, here, I think you should forget about the label of communism. I know the party, the oligarchy that controls the People's Republic is called the Chinese Communist Party, but that's actually in many ways not what they are. They are no longer buying into the kind of classical communist agenda uh, of the kind that you found, say, in the interwar Soviet Union, or indeed under Mao. Instead, it's an agenda for, again, a kind of modern society, but one that is highly authoritarian and, again, deeply collectivist with things like the extremely creepy uh, social credit scheme that the Chinese Communist Party has introduced. Once again, we're talking about a major debate, a debate taking place both within China itself, uh, between uh, proponents of a Chinese form of liberalism, but also obviously on a global scale between uh, proponents of liberal modernity and China, which is now presenting itself, or at least the Chinese government is presenting itself, as being an alternative route to development 
uh, modern civilization as compared to what it describes or uh, increasingly explicitly as the failed model uh, of uh, liberalism. Uh, and it's, to some degree, again, this is found in a less overtly authoritarian form in other parts uh, of East Asia, but it's obviously communist China. This is the primary example of it. Maybe, possibly, there is, there's a good reason why I've got a question mark here. There is another one, which is that of radical environmentalism. This hasn't yet come together to form a kind of self-aware political project in the way that the other ones I've gone through uh, have or did. Uh, but I think that, again, here we have the idea for an attempt to create some kind of semi-modern or maybe post-modern society that, again, however, will reject liberalism. So what I'm saying then is that in, since the 1770s, um, what has happened is that you've had the emergence both of the modern world and also of liberalism. And the two things can be thought of in some ways as two facets or sides of a single complex process. Because what has happened is that liberalism has emerged out of the debates and arguments going on, which have been going on for over 200 years now, about exactly how uh, modernity should be understood and what form it should take and how it should develop. And these arguments engaged in with interlocutors of various kinds, both uh, really hostile and maybe not quite so hostile, have both defined liberalism itself, but also through the successes of liberalism in winning both intellectual arguments and also political conflicts in determining a large part of the content of modernity. Now, as it says at the start here, there is a common belief amongst too many people, I think, that economic modernization necessarily entails and leads to a move to liberalism. In other words, the idea is that if you can only have a capitalist economy, if you move to a kind of modern economy with sustained intensive growth and all the rest of it, you're going to automatically generate liberal politics, uh, a liberal social life, uh, liberal culture, uh, a liberal lifestyle, if you will, one that emphasizes personal autonomy and freedom of choice. I think the evidence is that that is clearly not true. Uh, and so there's a kind of naive economic determinism at work here, a kind of almost classical liberal Marxism in which all of the rest of society and social life, politics, government, uh, culture and the rest is seen as a kind of superstructure that's ultimately determined by and flowing from the economic base. And I think that's just as wrong if given a pro-capitalist spin as it is in Marx's account of history and historical development. Uh, ideas do matter, uh, and also action matters. Uh, you can't simply assume that because you have a modern economy in China, for example, you're going to have, therefore, something like a liberal democracy. And finally, to reiterate the point I've made several times in this talk, we could very easily have ended up with a world that was recognizably modern, but not liberal. Uh, and that didn't happen, as it says here, because liberals won arguments and came out as the victors, in some cases, in conflicts. And the ideas were formed in arguments for some kinds of change, some kinds of development, some ways of living, and against others. And that remains the case today. But... Finally, and this is my last point, we should all say a few words of thanks for the great liberal heroes of the past who fought that fight and won those victories. So uh, let's start with one that came in uh, during the lecture. Can you say a little bit about how this relates to the Du Commerce thesis? And yeah. You might define that for folks who don't know what it means. Yes. Uh, the the Du Commerce thesis is an argument that's made for a very long time actually, uh, but particularly in the 18th century, which argues that uh, a society in which there is more commerce and trade is going to have a lent, softer, gentler manners because it's going to value the vir virtues of the bourgeois as opposed to those of the warrior. Now, <clears throat> I would say that my argument is a kind of amendment or qualification of that thesis because I think it probably is true to say as a matter of sociological fact, the, the more commercial a society is, the more it is indeed going to value those kind of uh, codes, if you will, ways of behavior, social norms, as compared to the kind of honor-based social norms that you get in a society where you still have a warrior aristocracy dominating everything. But 
I don't think there's some kind of necessary determinism by which, therefore, if you have a broadly commercial kind of society and economy, one of the lot of trade and commerce, it's going to automatically generate a particular kind of political system. And, as the case of, say, the antebellum South shows, what you can have is a broadly commercial society, very commercial in some ways, which still espouses a martial ethos in some ways. You could say that Prussian Germany is also a similar example of that. So I think there is something in the do commerce argument as a sociological model, but I don't think uh, I would uh, go as far as some of its more naive defenders do. Okay, great. Um, you mentioned that the, uh, the, the uh, some of the Soviet and fascist societies had uh, a specific relationship to art that was uh, yeah. very central to their ideologies. Can you say more about the relationship of art in classical liberalism? Oh, no, that's a very good question. Um, what I think you find is that in the very early period of uh, modernity, when liberalism is coming into existence, it tends to be associated with a very specific kind of uh, view of art, particularly architecture, but also the decorative arts, which is classicism, to be precise. So in 19th century Britain and elsewhere, typically, um, if you were a liberal in politics, you favoured neoclassical public buildings, whereas if you were a Tory or a conservative, you favoured Gothic revival. Uh, the two kinds of architecture actually had ideological implications. What you find, though, in um, liberal societies in the 19th century and explicitly argued for by liberal aesthetic theorists is eclecticism. And the form this takes in the 19th and early 20th century is the development of a whole series of art forms which are uh, based upon reviving, either reviving old art forms or uh, borrowing from non-European or non-Western civilizations uh, initially. Uh, and what that reflects is the wider notion that in fact, you should have a kind of more open, non-prescriptive idea of what the content of art should be. One that gives a greater scope for borrowing from different sources, combining different ideas, and allowing for the individuality of the artist. Okay. Could you say a little bit more about how we're defining modernity here? So uh, at what point uh, does a, an area or region become modern? Is there a, a threshold? Uh, I feel like I know what you're gonna say to this. Uh, and uh, the question continues, how much of a break from traditional civilization must there be? Yeah, but you to be, to be modern. Uh, yeah, well, what I'm going to say is you should read my book. Um, uh, my book, that is, which I published uh, last year, uh, the, the Wealth Explosion. Uh, the subtitle of that book is The Nature and Origins of Modernity. So I have a whole chapter which addresses precisely that question. And I think that, yes, there is a considerable break between modern societies and pre-modern or traditional societies. And that break often happens very, very suddenly. It typically takes place over about a couple of decades to three decades, no more than that, um, in terms of the actual radical shift. Is there a kind of threshold? Yes, there is. Uh, there's a number of clear features that have to be present before you can say that the society is modern. Um, a, a particular level of population growth, most importantly, sustained intensive economic growth, certain level of urbanization and a transformation of uh, social ways of life, uh, mores and so on. The breakdown, if you like, of traditional non-state structures of power and authority. I think those are just some of the most important ones I'd mention. I would add, by the way, that certain societies have deliberately tried to uh, avoid modernization. And this is possible, that they've never managed to stick with it. Madagascar, of all places, is one of the most interesting examples. The last empress of Madagascar had a serious go at preventing uh, her society from modernizing in any way, but uh, didn't work out. Hmm. Henry asks how the modernization that you just described looks in the context of Africa. Uh, could you say a little bit about uh, what you're observing there? Yes, uh, I, I, I noticed that question. The question is, to what extent do I know traditional African societies perhaps trying to cherry pick certain bits of modernity? And I would push back a bit on what I think is a kind of assumption in that question, which is that there's a kind of uh, stock list of uh, things you can have in modernity. It's a matter of, okay, I like this thing on the menu and that thing on the menu, but not that. Um, the point is that actually everyone is cherry picking all the time because the whole point of what I was talking about is that there's 
a kind of constant and ongoing argument within societies between different people as to what kind of things from the past you want to discard if you like or allow to pass away which ones you want to keep which ones you want to build on and develop and what kind of novel things you want to accept or which you might actually feel unhappy about. It's very wrong to think, by the way, that just because something has appeared, become technologically feasible or happened, that you have to stick with it. That's not true, actually. Uh, and it's simply, it's simply false. Uh, there are plenty of examples historically of societies that have uh, adopted a new technology and then completely, you know, abandoned it. Uh, the most spe spectacular example being how Japan abandoned firearms after having made major use of them for almost a hundred years. So, what I think is what, what I think is going on in Africa is the same thing that's happened in every other part of the world in the last two hundred years. It's that people are trying to work out uh, what they want to. Uh, keep or not there isn't a, it isn't a case of cherry picking modernity it's a matter of trying to define what modernity is now the question then for them you know in other words how are they going to live in the modern world uh, the question then is to what extent is anybody over there going to try and pick an anti-liberal form or variant of modernity actually i have to say that in africa we don't have the kind of aggressively modernist but anti-liberal uh, projects that we find in, say, North America or Asia or Europe. Uh, I think Af in Africa, actually, uh, there's a much more, I dare say, nuanced approach, if you will. And you don't, as yet anyway, have the kind of explicitly anti-modern uh, or rather modern but anti-liberal agenda that you find elsewhere. Speaking of anti-liberalism, um, when you think about uh, authoritarian regimes, Okay. Um, what's the role that prejudice, I think especially racial prejudice, has played in uh, propping up the, the, the sources of power that those regimes thrive on? A lot. Um, do I need to say more than that? Um, a, a, a huge amount, and often quite deliberately fermented in an extremely cynical way uh, by powerful groups, by the rulers of those societies. Uh, racial prejudice is one example religious prejudice actually, if anything, even more widespread, or simple intra-ethnic hostility. Uh, this is the traditional practice of imperial governments throughout history, but the British Empire, I think, developed it to a very fine degree in the second half of the 19th century. So it plays a major part. Okay. So, um, let's see. So the question is, um, does the connection between and the tension between conservatism and radicalism that you mentioned li lead uh, liberalism to some instability. Uh, and uh, specifically, mm -hmm. this question mentions the Weimar Republic. Um, but how much instability should we expect in liberal civilization, as you described it? Um, in one sense, quite a lot, because what you're talking about here is a very dynamic civilization. One of the central features of it is precisely that it's built around and uh, favours, encourages, makes possible widespread innovation, not just economic innovation, but also political, intellectual, cultural, artistic, the whole uh, gamut, in fact. And so in that sense, uh, modern civilization that has a liberal bent to it is going to be very dynamic, very unstable in the sense of constantly going down new directions and so on. Now, the question that underlies that is, um, if you have a liberal society, like, say, Weimar Germany, um, which has significant parts of its population and even more, perhaps, its elites that reject liberalism, maybe want modernity but want an illiberal form of it, um, is that ultimately sustainable? That's a very good question. Uh, probably not, actually. Um, another example would be France, which has had the problem for a lot of its history since the revolution of a division between a broad people who broadly accept the modern world on a broadly liberal basis, but several very powerful um, anti-liberal elements on both the left and the right. So you have both people at like the French Communist Party, the most Stalinist party in the world, and you had things like Action Francaise and the kind of ultras before them on the French right who espouse an extremely liberal form of uh, well, anti-liberal conservatism, basically. Uh, and I think the answer is yes, that is going to be highly unstable. Uh, and so one of the things you find in other societies, uh, Scandinavia, uh, most of the United States, Great Britain, um, is 
and Germany since 1945 is the establishment of a broad liberal consensus so that even those who are not fully inside the liberal circle will tend to accept certain basic features of the liberal settlement, if you will. If you don't, and this is a general observation, if you have any society that is divided on what you might call the fundamentals, uh, it's going to be very hard to keep that society politically stable. And this is a related question. Um, why do you think that the fatalistic notions of the death of liberalism and uh, liberal democracy continue to appear over and over again, uh, even while liberalization seems to be uh, gaining ground? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have an, answer, an easy answer to that. Um, I, I can just observe that this phenomenon happens. So we went through a period in the 1930s, 1940s, when it was pretty much commonplace to say that, you know, liberal civilization was on the way out, we'd moved beyond liberalism, we were in a you know, post-liberal era. Um, if you want to understand a lot of what John Maynard Keynes was about, he, he sort of felt that this was happening and he saw himself essentially, uh, for most of his life, as fighting a rearguard action to try and keep as much of liberalism going as possible in this world that we are moving into. And he was not alone in that, that was a common sentiment. Uh, we're seeing exactly the same kind of thing now, right down to the same vocabulary, you know, all this talk about post-liberalism and all this stuff. Why does this happen so repeatedly? Um, I think it may just be that after a while, you just get a kind of pushback against the uh, dynamism of liberal civilization. Uh, there is a sort of feeling that things have gone just too far and you want to have a kind of time out, if you will. Maybe that's the kind of popular sentiment. Uh, and there's also the fact that you get powerful groups whose oxes have been gored, uh, who want to push back against it. But why we go through this kind of intellectual cycle, I'm not quite sure, but I can certainly observe it. And the last question, could you talk a little bit about the diffusion of liberalism and perhaps the diffusion of some of these alternatives to liberalism? Uh, how you see it operating, where they win their you know, battles on the margins? Yeah. I, I, as I explicitly said, I reject the diffusionist argument. Uh, the diffusionist argument is that uh, a phenomenon, in this case, liberal modernity, appears in one place and then spreads out from it, a bit like the spread of COVID-19 from Wuhan, you might say, but more benign. Um, I don't think that's what happens. I think what you see happening in the modern world is a process by which modernity and also the liberal form or variant of modernity pop up uh, in various parts of the world. And there is an element of emulation or imitation of pr older or prior examples, but that doesn't mean that those uh, new episodes, if you will, are borrowed from or have spread from the older places. Rather, they're endogenous. They're, you know, developed on home ground, so to speak, even though they may involve looking over other parts of the world thinking, oh, what can we take from that? What can we copy from it? Uh, and so I think that's what is actually going on. And so I do have another lecture I've given about the global nature of liberalism in the modern era, which talks about how you get African liberalism, uh, liberal Confucianism in China, a kind of indigenous Indian liberalism, which are not simply importations of Western liberalism, they're indigenous uh, and they, they, they spring up in those places. The same is true, by the way, of the anti-liberal movements. Uh, it's not simply the case that all those people in Latin America or uh, the Middle East who admired and liked Imperial Germany were simply importing the kind of ideas uh, that the Bismarckian state had created. They had their own ideas which reflected their own local circumstances. It's just that they thought, yeah, that's, that's a place we like, we're going to try and borrow something from it. So these anti-liberal forms also appear uh, locally. Um, there's a very good book called Occidentalism uh, by Bar Ian Baruma uh, and Margaret Avishai, which uh, looks at what they call this kind of phenomenon, what they identify as how the same kind of rhetorical analytical themes appear uh, over and over again in different parts of the world. And it's very easy to think this is because of a kind of dispersion of these ideas and rhetorics, but actually it's not. It's just that they appear to be pretty uniformly the certain, a certain kind of response that you get to the appearance of liberal modernity.